Hello, welcome to Talking Europe. Now, barely a day goes by when we don't hear talk of some threat to European unity, people being driven apart rather than coming closer together. Now, my guest today is a man who is tasked with fighting those trends. Alvar Rukit is the new president of the European Economic and Social Committee, and now that's an advisory group within the European Union that, in its own words, aims to involve civil society more in the European venture. Now, as such, you might say Rupke is a point man for democracy in Europe, and his motto, stand up for democracy, speak up for Europe. Welcome to the show, uh, and thanks for being here. Um, you have a, a much tougher job description, I think, than I do. Uh, standing up Not for sure. <laughs> Well, you're, you're coming to the job at a tough time. Recent polls show dissatisfaction among Europeans with the way democracy is working in Europe is around 60%, really high. How did, did you feel like you're coming in at a tough time, an especially tough time? Your, your committee's been around 65 years. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, those are tough times for, for Europe, but also for my committee. I think we have uh, major challenges ahead of us, and therefore my priorities, as you rightly pointed out, are democracy, shrinking space for civil societies, not only outside Europe, but also within Europe, even within the European Union, protecting rule of law and fundamental rights. I think those are really the inter elemental and essential questions at the moment. And, and aren't they under threat right now? Because, you know, what I just said, right, 60% of Europeans are dissatisfied yes. with democracy. Yes. But the same survey shows that 90%, 9 out of 10 Europeans, uh, they defend the values of freedom of speech, of rule of law, of free elections. Isn't there a contradiction here? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Therefore, we want to serve as a gateway for democracy and for fundamental rights and also as a watchdog. I think we have to make sure wherever democracy is under threat, shrinking space of civil society is there, then we have to raise our voice as a committee. And this we will do. We did it already in the past, but we will be much louder in the future. This is actually my commitment. You used a big word there. I used it as well, civil society. Yes. Everyone seems to have, I guess, their own definition of civil yes. society, right? There's, there's formal civil society organizations, yes. and there's the more informal civil yes. society. How do you define it? Well, civil society in our house is clearly defined. It's organized civil society, and we have three major groups, which means employers' organizations, trade unions, and civil society organizations, including consumer organizations, agriculture, uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs, and so on. So we, we try to cover the whole range of civil society organizations, but we want to be more representative. Therefore, my clear commitment is also to involve civil society organizations and citizens outside the committee in our work. Okay. I think this is the way to, to build the bridge. Let, let me now just, uh, you know, take a little bit of a sledgehammer to your bridge. Um, so let's look at the union right now. Countries like Hungary, like Poland, just to name a couple, right now would say they're democratic. They'd say, yeah, we have civil society. They just have a very different vision of it. Uh, the rest of Europe, Brussels, a lot of people think they're not even upholding rule of law there. How do you respond to that? How do you even bridge that? Actually, we have, a, we have clear positions in our group, uh, in our committee. We have a dedicated group which deals only with fundamental rights and the rule of law. This is a group which is highly respected in Brussels. We present together with the Commission the, the rule of law report, for example. We, um, we have missions to those countries where we exactly uh, exercise and see how is the situation uh, for civil society organizations. And then, as my motto and my slogan, we will speak out and we will be clear. Speak we up will, for Europe. Yes. Okay. Um, you're in France right now. Um, some people have found it hard to speak out here. Uh, you have undoubtedly seen all of the images in recent weeks and months <clears throat> of, uh, I'll, I'll use the word unrest on the streets yes. of France. Um, that's civil society at its best, is it, or not? Or is it at its worst? People here say there is no democracy, a lot of people. There's no democracy in France. We have an undemocratic government. Well. People are on the streets, civil society organizations, in this case trade unions are on the street. Yeah. This is a sign for a lively democracy. This is important. But as representative of organized civil society, I'm always in favor of dialogue, of civil dialogue and also of social dialogue. So I think the best solutions are always in a broad consensus. So therefore mm -hmm. we are striving for broader consensus. This is also our principle in the committee and I think this is the best way forward 
to, so, to show solutions. It, 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 let me play devil's advocate. It sounds very reasonable, right? You're Austrian. Your experience, yes. you cut your teeth in the Austrian workers' groups and movements. You're very uh, well familiar with the union situation across Europe. Um, France is a little different, some would say. There has not really been dialogue, or at least it's been extremely hard to get the unions and the executive to sit down together. How, where do you start with that? I understand what you're saying. Br try to bridge the, where do you concretely, how do you start? Well, well the, the cultures are different across Europe, as you said. We have Very a, different. We have a culture of, of social dialogue uh, in some countries and other countries. We go more for conflict and, and uh, for industrial actions. You could use the word, say, France. You could say France. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, of course. But uh, I think this is, not a, this is not a problem because I'm not in favor of a one-size-fits-all approach. Okay. Yeah, and France... Has a has a big uh, history, a large history, and is also a very uh, vital democracy. So I think it is okay if you have also disputes and if you go on the streets. But I think in the end, it should be necessary that politicians always enter into dialogue with civil society organizations, with the social partners, in order to try to find avenues for future solutions. So steady as she goes, try to find uh, avenues for dialogue. Now, you said at the top of this, uh, this interview that your remit is not just inside Europe. You're looking outside Europe, too. There are 10 countries right now in the waiting line to become European Union members. Yes. We know Turkey is very prominent among them, having elections. Uh, but Ukraine, especially Ukraine. Yes. That, to me, seems like a giant, giant challenge in your inbox right now. What do you say to Ukraine right now? They would like to join now, today. They want to join now. And we gave a clear signal, the European Union gave a clear signal, a political signal, yes, you are a candidate. And our committee was in favor of the candidate status. But it is clear that all the candidate countries have to comply uh, with the criteria. To, to access and to, to join the European No Union. exceptions. I mean, not, not exceptions, no. but no, no wiggle room to speed up a country's timeline. Of, of course, of course. We have to respect the criteria. I think this is also the lesson from the past. Countries have to be ready. Also, their civil society, their democracy, their rule of law has to be robust and ready for the European Union. This is clear. But we cannot let them waiting in the waiting room, grant them candidate status, and then we do, uh, don't do anything. Right. We have to be proactive. And here as a committee, we play a very active role. We are committed. We are committed hmm. to help civil society uh, in accession countries, including Ukraine, to actually to, to speak up, to speak up to be visible and to be respected. And I think this is the best way to prepare them for their enlargement of the European Union. I don't know when, I don't know when, but it is, it is a step-by-step -step process. So it's not that we wait now, they sit in the waiting room, and then after 5, 10, or 15 years, uh, right. they can join. I and I will just note, Turkey has been in that waiting room for 24 years. They yes. launched their bid in 1999. Um, moving on, you, there are... European Union elections coming up in uh, 2024. I think the tentative date is June 2024. Yes. Um, they're always surrounded by a lot of indif indifference. It's always a challenge getting people to turn out. That's also part of your job, isn't it? I, I mean, I'm already tired just hearing the first part. I'm like, you know, the day's oh. over. What do you do with that? How do you get people into... The European elections are crucial. The yeah. next commission is crucial. As you, as you said, democracy is under threat, so it must be really a signal for democracy yeah. and for a stronger Europe. Therefore, we as committee, we are clearly committed to be involved in all actions and in um, mobilization of people. But what does that mean? To, to I'm sorry, what does that mean concretely? Because a lot of people don't even know about European Union elections. Even Europeans here, you know, voting in their own national, yes. they don't know, oh, European, what's that? Don't you have to start with the very basics, the messaging? This, we're having an election in Europe, and here's why it's important. Of, of course, of course, with the basics, but I think it's always better to show concrete examples why Europe is important, why a European solution is better than a pure national solution. And we, here we have a lot of uh, good examples from the mm. past. You know, we, we have the European pillar of social rights, but we have also um, our attempts and our, our efforts to increase competitiveness, open strategic autonomy, Within Europe, I think those are the replies to the challenges, and those replies are European replies. So therefore, I think those are the best arguments to convince people, reach out, go to the elections, and vote uh, for pro-European uh, forces. When you see candidates waiting to join the EU, I would 
correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen that you see it as a sign of strength that people still believe in the European idea. Yes. They yes. want to be part of Europe. Yet within Europe, a lot of people don't want them coming in. Um, and, and we see a lot of that, right? The, it's not just populism and nationalism. It's a real sense that we're large enough already. Yes. How do you counter that? Yes. My personal experience is that sometimes citizens within the EU see those countries also as a threat. They see them as a threat for their workplaces, for their wages, and therefore it is so important that we have also joint rules, not only for the single market, for a very strong single market, but also for social Europe. I think this is important. Here we can show if we have robust uh, rules for this, a, a really a mandatory European pillar of social rights, then we can make sure that at least the same level, basic level of social protection should apply to all of them. So to make sure that they are not a threat to the wages or to the workplaces of people within the European Union. Within the EU. Yeah. And, and within the EU here in France, there's a, a local story. I say that in quotes. Um, there's a proposed law to make it a requirement for town halls to fly the European Union flag alongside the French flag on their facade. You might say, well, okay, is that really controversial? It is here in France, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in towns where the extreme right uh, either has power or has a lot of influence. They are not doing that. They say we should embrace France. We're France. Do you think this is a, a petty debate? Do you have other fish to fry, as they say? Well, you, you know what comes into my mind. If I go to candidate countries, if I reach out to candidate countries, to the Western Balkans, then those countries are the countries with the most of European flags. I can see them everywhere there. So they see Europe as a, as a hope, I would say, and, and as their future. So I think we cannot force this. We cannot force this. I'm in favor to show always the European flag next to the national flag. But if someone else uh, is not in favor of this, let's convince them by arguments. Oliver Rupke, you're a busy man. I'm going to let you go because you have a lot of work to do. I get Thanks a sense uh, from, our, from our talk there. Um, but I do wish you luck. Uh, speaking up for Europe, Standing up for democracy, that's the job description that the president of the EESC has, um, and it's a tall order, but uh, he says it can be done with more civil society and more participation. Thanks to all of you for watching the interview here on Talking Europe.